I was I was watching a, a clip of your quartet, um, I think from a fairly recent show at Sharp Nine. Okay. And you played a tune. I think it's called "Come with Me." Come what may. Come what may. Uh -huh. I couldn't really. I, I couldn't make it out. So it's called "Come What May." Sorry. Um, and I love like behind the sax solo, the way that you're comping is with um, kind of smallish shapes. Mm -hmm. um, in a tune where you certainly could play lots of you know full voice chords but mm -hmm. i loved how um kind of punchy and to the point it was to hear these shapes behind the sax solo but he's still not missing anything i wonder if you could talk about um how you how you approach that how you would do that sure uh yeah let's see um I think I like to like when I think about comping or anything, I, I think I, I really think melodically and melodically and rhythmically. Um, so like when, as you were asking the question, I was thinking, hmm, why was I doing that? Um, and I guess I feel like, you know, if you, if I start in with just full on chords, you know, then I'm sort of mentally thinking like, okay, chord, you know, there's one chord, what's the next chord? You know, I'm, I'm thinking like in, in big chord shapes or, I don't know, uh, I, I like to think more like setting up, you know, what are you doing as a comper? You're adding some harmony, you're adding some rhythmic interest, some counterpoint, some sonic texture. So in a quartet, when I'm playing electric, I'm, you know, I'm really thinking about sonically and just adding adding another you know element to the to the music hmm. um uh and and so i i go for some kind of interesting sound maybe so like you know like i just started with, i'm thinking of that tune in c minor and i just that's the first thing that just came to mind now it's just like some kind of interesting little sound that gives a little flavor of the chord and some rhythm and something also like that feels fresh to me so that I immediately it puts me in a to the creative unknown rather mm. than if I just go to something that feels more stock then I feel like I'm in stock guitar comping headspace huh so I, I I'm kind of like priming my own pump by starting with something small that's that's different that I haven't done before and that that I know is going to make me like kind of go down a new a new road a little bit. I think that's part of it, too. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So and then and then smaller things are easier to, you know, move around, too. So because and, and, I, and I know I'm going to want to be kind of melodic and and move around a little bit melodically. like on C minor or whatever, like something like that. Whereas if I just go, you know, <laughs> that's, that's going to be a much bigger ordeal to try to move that around and be melodic. So, hmm. yeah, so I want to, I want to be mobile and melodic and rhythmic. And so much easier to do that with something small hmm. and much easier for me to get out of a familiar stock thing with something small and, and that feels new in the moment. And then I can like follow that, that mm -hmm. thread. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, also, as a, as a soloist, you know, I don't like tons of big chords behind me anyway. And, and I just like, and, and I like the sound of there being some, some harmonic thing there, but also some space. So as a comper, you know, I'm not trying to just fill in these big chords behind the soloist either. I'm trying to like allude to a little bit of harmony so like that the audience can kind of hear, you know, hear what's going on, but also leave a lot of space, a lot of headroom for for the soloist and for the other instruments to, to be heard, you know. So I, I kind of really in just in every way dig the sound of like, you know, two or three note chords on the guitar as far as comping goes versus big fat chords that 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 kind of max out the space behind the soloist right 
Right. And yeah. And, and you, you said like, you know, what you like behind your solos is, you know, the golden rule of, of comp comp unto <laughs> others as you would have them <laughs> right. comp unto you. Um, it, well, that was interesting because another thing I wanted to ask you about, and again, I'm, I hope I'm getting the title right. FD Av. Oh, uh, SD Av. Uh, SD Av. -E it's uh, this, the street of Kate's childhood home, which is where I wrote the tune. Oh. <laughs> um, well, on this live uh, uh, performance that I saw on YouTube, it was really cool. Like you actually do comp for yourself during your solo like you'll play lines and then you'll play chords or like in the beginning of your solo there's some open string stuff and you're kind of down uh in open position and getting things kind of like simmering and then when you move up and start playing lines and you know, like grab a shape play grab a shape play mm -hmm. and um i wonder like to me it struck me as wonderfully guitaristic it didn't seem like you were trying to like be like well what would mccoy tyner do but really <laughs> like uh -huh. i play the guitar like how much do you think about doing st stuff that feels of the instrument versus uh, -huh. uh coming from some other place yeah um well yeah for chords if the if the specific chords and and key allow i love using open strings and and uh i mean that's i'm kind of looking for that like whatever the whatever the chord is whatever the key is you know there's almost always like at least one open string available mm. um and then that tune in particular you know it starts out a flat minor so you've got the b string and then uh e major seven sharp 11 so you've still got the, the b string and then c minor so you've got E string and the B string, hmm. and then uh, F minor. So you've got the G string. Oh wow! And then G minor. Open D string, A minor, A minor, B B major seven sharp eleven. Open D, open E, open G if you want. You know so. Uh, I guess that's part of the sound of that solo section to me is like these these kind of lush open stringy guitar chords so i take <laughs> i take the opportunity to, to throw those things in hmm. um uh so yeah I, I love you know i love that that sound on uh guitar chords even right more regular jazz chords i'm always just looking for you know, for the open strings to get opportunities to have more interesting voicings and interval combinations. I'm really into thinking about chords that the creating the sound of the voicing by thinking about what the combination of intervals is more so than just what the name of the chord is like, you know, C sharp minor 11. And if you're just thinking shapes, you might just go, right? Mm -hmm. Or but I find that there's so much more to play with in terms of creating a variety of chord sounds by thinking more about how you assemble the intervals, meaning like, so so this this is like a minor third and then a fifth and then a major third and then a minor third, talking about the space between each note. Yeah. But what if I go like, you know, one note and then like a huge leap and then a really small interval? Right? Hmm. All of a sudden, we have a completely different sound. It's still called C sharp minor eleven, but right. you know now we've got because and I, and I'm just thinking about combinations of intervals and having done this a lot, thinking knowing kind of what types of things sound good like. I always find like a large interval and then a small interval together for some reason always always sounds interesting to me. Huh. So like I'm I'm going to take a fifth and then a half step. Those are me my two intervals is a fifth and a half step. So mm. I'm going from the fifth of C sharp minor 
to the ninth, which is the interval of the fifth, and then from the second mm. to the flat third is a half step. And for whatever reason, it, you know, that sounds really cool to me. Um, so I think a lot, it's as far as like, you know, coming up with lots of uh, different chords on, on a chord type, I really think about assembling them with intervals and, and creating different sounds that way because I find if I think C sharp minor 11 how many different C sharp minor 11 grips do I know like two right. but if I play around with just the intervals it's literally infinite hmm right wow and do you find that like different kinds of structures would be like that particular yeah grab an axe like depending on on what is happening like whether you're playing say uh behind a vocal or behind a bass solo mm -hmm. or something might would you think about different kinds of structures or, or is it is not as specific like that Oh, absolutely. It's 100%, you know, situation specific, you know, like if I'm playing solo guitar behind a vocalist, as I often do with Kate and other people, I'll be thinking about, you know, in that moment, like often you're kind of creating a bed of, of sound, you know, and I probably wouldn't play like a half step interval right near the what she's singing. Hmm. And I probably wouldn't even have a half step interval like on top of the chord because it's because it just sticks out and kind of grabs your attention. So in that case, I would probably I still use lots of half step intervals, but I would bury it in the middle of the chord where it gets softened by having a more neutral and melodic note up above it. Hmm. Um, you know, so like. So there's my C sharp minor. And I still have that half step interval in there using the open E and a fretted G sharp way up here, but I have, but I have a fifth above it and it just softens the, the impact of that. And you still get the tension and the interest of it, but it's not like just sticking out on top. And, and right. Wow. So like when, you know, when I do this, it kind of comes forward when I do this, it kind of like creates a smoother bed. So I'm, when I'm, company of vocalists, I'm, I'm just trying to make this really nice lush bed behind them. And so I'm choosing, you know, voicings and intervals to just to create to create as as rich and juicy of a of an atmosphere and a bed behind them as I can. Hmm. Hmm. But if I'm playing in a jazz context, and I'm and something rhythmic and angular is going on, then I might just lean into that. Right? Right. Right. And st and still, like, finding some of that stuff via open strings and, like, uh, ex exploiting the guitar as because it it's it's nice that that kind of stuff is available and le maybe less of kind of... Yeah. Stretchy grabs. <laughs> yeah. Because when I watch you play, like, there, there's always, like, this... Um, that kind of those kind of sounds are always in the air but when i look at your hands it's you know i don't it's <laughs> yeah. not like like john stowell or something yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know spilled out across 10 frets most of the time anyway it seems no there's no, a, there's a real, no it's totally you know, that's totally accurate I, i've i've just I, I think i decided long ago like when i try it when i was like learning some you know exploring voicings like that and it's just like i'm never gonna actually do do this on the fly you know so i i just i just didn't really buy i mean obviously people uh practice it and can do it as f facilely uh, as anyone but that was like ben monder for example but that was just i was just like you know what i just don't see myself you know doing this on the fly and i just noticed when i was playing in the moment of playing i just noticed yeah i'm not trying to like be doing thinking about doing these these 
difficult maneuvers. And, and I just love, and, and I actually, in addition to the types of voicings you can get, I just love the sound of, of the open strings and the fretted notes. I mean, it's, it's definitely my favorite sounding thing on the guitar. And it's so cool because like every guitar sort of sounds different when you do that. Yeah. So it just, I've, that's like the the sandbox for me. So um, I just went that way instead of the stretch way. And, hmm. you know, and at first you might think like, well, you know, you've got your A minor and your E minor, but what about your, you know, D flat major and all that. But I literally just went through and it, I've, not, I've just never been at any kind of disciplined or methodical exhaustive practicer of anything but one thing i did do because i was so into it i just literally went through every type of chord in every key and, and wrote down what the what open strings could be used oh, wow. and then just and then played with voicings for all of them hmm. like really all the way through a minor a major a dominant b flat minor b flat major b flat dominant and and it's kind of amazing that, that almost every single type of chord you know d flat major seven sharp 11 <laughs> d flat yeah. one three open g yeah. oh wow beautiful or one five and then open g and then nine. oh wow i've never played that that's beautiful Know, so even on chords that you wouldn't necessarily think, right. A flat major, one six, open G three. Oh, that's gorgeous. The open strings are everywhere. Huh. Uh, <laughs> well, then I, I have to ask you. I was watching a video of you with Kate doing Laura. Uh huh. And you do it in. I think of it as in G because it ends up in G, even though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you like nudge Kate into G for that, or that just happens to be a, a, the right yeah. place for her? That was a spur of the moment thing where someone at the club came up and said, "They're a dear friend of theirs and of the club named Laura had had recently passed and asked mm -hmm. if we would play Laura." which we had never played before. And uh, I can't remember if that was just a happy accident that it ended up starting on, on E minor, or if I suggested it. Um, but it's just, I certainly might have suggested it if she said, let's do it in A flat. I might have certainly said, how about, how about G? Okay. Cause you know, playing in that situation, playing duo with Kate and, you know, we're so much about these lush soundscapes and whatnot. I, I'll certainly uh, angle for getting getting some open strings. And, and a lot of tunes, I use a capo on the first fret. Uh, hmm. If, you know, if it's like an arrangement that's pretty, that's kind of pretty involved, I don't necessarily want to change the key of the arrangement, but there's a handful of tunes that I play like with the capo on the first fret just to get it to, to sort of play it in D rather than E flat or something. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Is there, um, is there a particular one that, that comes to mind that I, I could check out later and, or, and. Uh, like that? Sure. Uh, right. yeah. Her, her song, um, climb down is in, is an E flat and, uh, and I play it you know, with the capo and in, in drop D. playing music I assume that you there's a lot of jazz in your in your in your back pages 
was the capo always something that seemed cool or did you ever like when you were younger think oh why would i need a capo <laughs> uh yeah that's a good question well I, I i didn't start out playing acoustic guitar at all so i was you know already playing jazz before i played any acoustic guitar um and i think i was certainly aware of the notion that like you know a real a real guitar player wouldn't need a capo um but as soon as i got into acoustic guitar stuff and one of the one of the first people that really got me into it is this incredible guitar player and songwriter uh, named Paul Carreri, who we do a couple of his songs, like on our latest record, God Moves on the City is one of his songs. And on our duo album, um, Beneath the Crozet Trestle Bridge, that's also a Paul Carreri tune. Uh, I, I heard him playing, he does, it was like kind of Travis picking, but, but a really flowy, you know, amazing and personalized version of of that and i just started trying to learn those so i was like holy crap like you know i had no idea that someone would just could just sit down one person with an acoustic guitar and create that much rhythm and you know that full of a of an accompaniment for themselves you know at that time i was playing jazz guitar and if if you asked me to play something solo it would be rubato you know like <laughs> Right. You know, I wouldn't be able to play anything that had that that much, you know, driving rhythm to it, hmm. but also kind of open ended, not like strumming or, or chugging. Right. So, uh, so I started trying to learn his songs and, you know, they're completely capo dependent. You can't do a, you know, an open tuning Travis picking thing by barring all the notes. So right. <laughs> that. So that just immediately, you know, solved that if I, I, you know, it may have been in my head at that point that like, oh, capos are like, you know, for beginners or something. But as soon as I started delving into acoustic guitar music, I realized, oh, capos are so that you can get awesome yeah. sounding open string stuff in whatever key you want. Right. 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 It is still challenging to play jazz, though, even though I've been doing it for all these years. Uh, you know, we, if I play a tune with her with a capo and then go to take a solo, <laughs> uh, it's 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 I'm kind of OK with it now, but it's can be confusing. <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. I, I know that one all too yeah. well. Yeah. Um, any tricks for for how to transcend that oh man um well i mean i guess one thing would be to like if i'm going to take a solo and i'm in the capo is to sort of try to forget about the open strings and just play and just play fretted stuff because then it doesn't then it doesn't matter hmm. i'm still looking like if i'm looking at the fretboard in, in e flat minor and I don't think about any open strings, then I'm cool. So I, and that's probably the, the shift that I make is like, as soon as it's time to solo, I'm, I'm going to try, try to just stick to the fretboard and, and kind of ignore the open strings. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so fun to use them that I always will get pulled back. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and I think I'm okay with it now just because I've done it enough. But for a long, long, long time, I would, I would, you know, reach for the forbidden fruit and, you know, <laughs> and then, then I then throw myself off. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to ask you about had to do with um, something that you are so great at and and must do all the time, which is like reducing a full band arrangement to a duo arrangement like i uh on on your record there's there's this uh, incredible arrangement of 59th street bridge song uh with uh trumpet and electric piano and bass and drums and and then i i saw a version of you on youtube where it's just the two of you i wonder if you could talk about 
how, you know, what, what stays, what gets left behind. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Um, and yeah, it's been a, a really fun part of my guitar life with, with Kate is, um, taking all these arrangements that we've done that she's done and or that I've done with the with the band and figuring out a way to 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 do them duo that's just been kind of like my fun uh you know thing to practice on guitar and thing and way of exploring the guitar um you know I try to it depends on on the arrangement but if there's any specific figures you know I definitely try to to uh use them include them and then i try to you know capture whatever the rhythmic feel is somehow which is a, a fun process for me and um and as someone uh you know i didn't like i said i didn't like learn acoustic guitar uh as a as a beginner starting out so i didn't learn any of the finger picking patterns which may actually help me in this regard because I just approach creating rhythm just completely by falling into it and just trying stuff rather than like having finger picking patterns that hmm. you know a more traditional acoustic guitar player might go like you know this finger picking pattern or this finger finger picking pattern or um i just try to kind of emulate the somehow the sound of, of of the rhythmic feel so like for that for that tune when it gets to the you know to the there's that intro where she where she does a spoken word thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's this bass figure two, three, four. Um, so I hit the I hit the bottom part, and then I just create some rhythm up top for that part as more of like a jazz way of playing of comping and playing time. But when it gets to the song part. Um, so I guess in the track there's, you know, it's like swing brushes, but, but kind of a whole note on the bass. And I just, I just, just like, I just kind of paddle a little bit just to create a little bit of, you know, time, just like the drums are doing. Yeah. But I still want to create the feeling of it landing because we're coming out of this chaotic thing. So I, I want that. I want it to empty out into that long whole note while she's singing. But you know, there needs to be some time over a period of four bars. So you know, I just add a, just a little bit of of time in there but not like a figure that that uh that that's um fills up the whole measure hmm. that's so much of when i play behind her i'm you know mostly doing that ra rather than because our thing is so flowy and ebb and you know we want it to ebb and flow so i'm almost never like just playing a full rhythmic pattern that just keeps going um so i'm always you know kind of hitting bass notes <laughs> And adding a little bit hmm. right and adding a little bit of rhythm in there but not filling it up so that it always feels like there's this kind of open open flowing space that can and so that i can respond to her dynamically too if she if she comes down and i can let it hang and if she starts building towards something, you know, I can build with her. So that's, that's a big part of it too. Now that I think about it, it's just, is having, being, having myself available to, to follow her dynamically and to follow her intensity shifts. If I'm just pegged into, right. then I, that's much harder to do. Right. And she hates that too. So <laughs> still be like, stop doing that. Open it up. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it seems like 
you, you've been playing together how how long? Uh, eighteen years. Hmm. Yeah, watching you play. Um, I mean, I've got I've got to see you play together in real life, but uh, folks watching this will may, maybe have seen you, but also can can see you on YouTube. But it, it it's always like the level of the the depth of the connection is 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 really um uh it's just moving to to watch you play together and and watch how much you're tuned into each other thanks um did, were you always an accompaniment guy like before you started playing with Kate were you playing with other singers or was this was that kind of a shift for you uh yeah no I, I was I was already pretty much like in singer world in 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 New York um you know I was when I when I moved there I was just you know instrumental I was just in, into instrumental jazz and being a jazz guitar player and trying to hang and and uh and I just, you know, got called for some some vocal gigs, and and I just found that I just really liked it. I liked the, you know, the clarity of things, and and the and that the song, you know, still each song, you know, retained its some kind of specific, you know, vibe or compositional element of the song. Where especially at that time, like, you know, when a on a jazz gig, like every, you know, every single song just turned into a, a nine minute, you know, <laughs> cosmic exploration, right. which was cool, you know, and, uh, but I mean, I, honestly, I would find myself getting bored on the bandstand, which is a weird feeling to, to be like, yeah. man, and I would be thinking, wow, I'm bored. <laughs> the audience, has, some of the audience has to be bored. I can't be right. the only one. Right, right. Um, so when I started playing the singer gigs, I was, I was, I was into it. It was like, you know, I mean, I grew up on pop music, not on, on jazz and, and, and it, you know, there was el lots of elements of it that I was like, oh, I really like this. I like, I like kind of creating an arrangement. I like, you know, playing off of an arrangement or playing off of a, you know, a, a specific vibe for the song so that every song is, is different and not doesn't turn into the same the same thing hmm. so yeah i got so yeah that was before kate i was you know i'm i moved to new york in 98 and i met kate at the end of 2003 i think and so i was already you know most of my gigs were 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 vocal gigs at that point yeah you know but but jazz like mm -hmm. uh but yeah i mean that was just that became my scene i mean I, you know playing with people and just kind of creating arrangements and, you know, mostly pickup gigs, but just like creating kind of a little, a, just a little bit of an arrangement on the spot so that each tune, you know, kind of felt special, especially if you're playing like a three hour standards gig and, right. and the gig, the songs are three or four minutes long and you're playing 40 tunes <laughs> to not just be like, okay, one, two, one, two, right. three, the next swing tune. Right. Right. It's so easy to to get into that frame of mind. And then, yeah, everything is just the same, the yeah. same medium swing. <laughs> now I'll walk the bass a little bit. Okay, yeah. cool. Now, you know. Yeah. So I really oh. just got into accompanying the singers and creating a, you know, some sort of a vibe or arrangement for the tune to make it feel special. And, and, and I just, that I was just totally my, my scene once I was in there and, and, and I'm sure that's why I got then, I, then everyone that was calling me was, was vocalists because I was, you know, the fact that I enjoyed it was obvious when a lot of people, you know, didn't, a lot of people would be rolling their eyes like, oh, okay, gotta play Fly Me to the Moon with some singer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, when word gets out that you enjoy it and you're good at it, yeah. The, I, d I didn't know you then, but I could imagine you being a busy guy. Yeah, that was the busiest I ever was, was, was in New York playing with, with all the vocalists. And that was really, really fun to do. Hmm. Yeah. So when I met Kate, 
I was fully in that world, but I hadn't, but really in a jazz, mostly in a jazz way. And then it wasn't until I got with Kate where uh, uh, I was already kind of like secretly practicing acoustic guitar at home, um, but only playing jazz gigs and, and even wondering to myself, like, you know, am I ever going to, in what way would I ever use any of this acoustic guitar stuff that I'm doing at home? I was writing, writing tunes on acoustic guitar and learning these, you know, Paul Carreri tunes. And just, that was kind of like all I was practicing at home was acoustic guitar stuff. And then I got together with Kate and, you know, she started suggesting, you know, oh, do you know this Ricky Lee Jones tune? Do you know this tune? And then that's when it was just like, ah, here we go. There's where I get to use my acoustic guitar stuff. Hmm. And so that just really opened up with her and our little kind of hybrid of, of the openness of, uh, of jazz. And then the, the song, uh, the song specificity of, of pop music kind of came together. Hmm. And how did you get into d doing so much on the nylon string? I know sometimes you play an acoustic nylon string. Sometimes you play a Godin. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, how did you get into that? Um, yeah. So at that time I was playing steel string and I had this, I don't know if you can see that blue, uh, ovation. That was kind of my main guitar for a while, which I, I still love, um, steel string. Uh, you know, that, so I was playing that blue ovation and it's awesome with the group, but solo, it didn't, it didn't like spread out that much. It has like a little bit more of a focused contained sound, which is maybe why it's cool with the group. Cause it's kind of punchy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was just looking for a, a wider, a sound that spread out more behind Kate. And after trying things, I just found that the nylon string just felt sort of more elastic, um, just eat and, and more and a little more versatile too like steel string really sounds like acoustic guitar world you know even if you're playing uh jazzy stuff on it and i found that the nylon string felt a little bit more open-ended and i felt like it just felt more versatile like i could flow between thing if i started finger picking it didn't all of a sudden sound like we just put a different album on you know huh. um it just felt like more of its own kind of world. And it's just like, I don't know, the feeling in my hands is like mm -hmm. just a little more elastic and just felt easier to just do the kind of flowy stuff that we do. Whereas steel string, you kind of got to commit a little bit more, you know, to, uh, to articulate things. And I could be a little more subtle and ghosty on the nylon string and which I, which I do so much of with her when I'm just going. You know, mm. it's just easier to, to, to tread lightly and move around and be, be versatile for me. And I think I also started to like it. It was just easier on my hands too. But mainly just for the, the more open-ended uh and sound and elasticity it just felt like i could cover all the bases that of the stuff we do more hmm. yeah that makes sense that makes sense and um i'm curious what is that uh, epiphone electric that that you play oh oops this thing is i just love it's a uh from from looking on youtube um I think it's uh, Epiphone Wilshire okay. and I think it's from 1963. And, you know, I think I measured the scale and it seemed, and it's actually a regular scale, but it definitely looks and feels small. Yeah. And I actually really like it because I, f I find, I feel like I can cover like a lot of range. I feel like I have more range, like right immediate access to somehow, maybe especially compared to like nylon string where that would feel like huge, you know, leaps. And so for, for playing jazz, 
Ooh. I just feel like I've got like, you know, three octaves like right there under my under my fingers. And that's it's I, I don't know. I just love it. And I love the sound of it. The pickups are really just warm and they don't have any kind of pokey mid range that I'm always trying to get rid of you know, <laughs> on other electric guitars. Um, and this was uh, my, my dear friend, Debbie Boxel. Uh, her, her aunt passed away and she had all these guitars and I was over there for Thanksgiving and her mom was like, oh, check out Aunt Mary's guitars. Let me know like or if they're worth anything or, you know, or just, you know, you might think they're cool. And I picked this up and it was so small and I was looking for a small guitar for airplanes because my Guild Starfire no longer fits in the overhead bin. And I was like, yeah. oh, let me see this. And I hadn't played a, a solid body since high school, probably. And I picked it up and it, it just felt great in my hands and the, and the action felt great. I didn't even, it might've been sitting in her closet for decades, who knows? But I mean, it didn't need a setup or anything. It was just, I just love it. It, and it just it doesn't sound like a strat it doesn't sound like a jazz guitar it doesn't sound like a telly it just it feels like you know this kind of un, un untrodden snow that i can just like kind of make make my own so i just love it wow but yeah i think it's a epiphone wilshire okay what a beauty yeah it's just got these dark woolly woolly pickups that's just it's just great i mean this is just plugged into to my bud with no effects or anything it's just got it's just got so much vibe wow. and you know like your first when you were your first questions about the comping i found with this guitar and i'm sure i was playing this guitar one of the things many things i love mm -hmm. about it is that i feel like you know it's just got a vibe even with one or two notes yeah so that that just you know even helps me go further into what you're talking about of like when we were talking about comping behind a horn player and using a couple of notes because it feels like I can you know do so much in the music with with just a couple of notes. So that just like launched me even further into that. And then that's why I love so much about it. Cause it's like, I can just play one note and, and feel like I'm got, got some music happening and then, and then just develop from there. Mm. So I may even do that more on this guitar than, than maybe if I was playing a, a jazz, regular jazz guitar. That's incredible how, how rich it is just it's, right into the <laughs> it is it is it's wow. wild, wild wow. this thing wow well man keith um uh, this this has been amazing to 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 get to ask you you know i've been watching videos and listening to records and to to get to get inside uh of of the music with you has been really um illuminating and oh, inspiring man. to me like i'm it's in it's already into the afternoon i haven't really practiced today now all i want to do <laughs> when we get off is just practice and and explore this stuff so oh man well i appreciate the questions it's it's fun to, to think about all that stuff you know each time you ask the question i'm like oh what is what is that hmm. 